Well, good morning, everyone. It is good to see you. Welcome to those joining us online. I'm Ramona Lynn Bethley, lead pastor here. And uh, today is Christ the King Sunday. I, I kind of have gotten the vibe from you, Elizabeth, that that is like one of your favorites. So uh, Elizabeth is our liturgical nerd. And uh, <laughs> I mean that in the kindest of ways, though. <laughs> So Christ the King Sunday marks the end of the Christian year. So next week is the beginning of the New Year's, and it begins with Advent. So we close out the year with Christ the King, making uh, the idea is that Christ, our Lord and Savior, is our King, our Shepherd, our Ruler, our One and Only. Now, if we are honest with ourselves in the United States, we're not, we're not too good on uh, kingly submission. Uh, we, have, we have kind of this romantic view as we look across the pond at the royalty, but we, we are not ones who want to submit. I mean, it's the whole reason why the United States of America was established, so we would not have kingly rule. But, uh, and while we don't have earthly kings, what I hope that we will do is that in this service, we will see the value of why we should make our Lord and our Savior our King and our Shepherd. So as we begin this time of worship, let us pray. Loving Lord of light and life, we come to you this day in celebration of the witness of your Son, Jesus Christ. In this time of worship, open our hearts, our spirits, and our lives to your will and to your way that we may be faithful followers this we pray in the name of jesus our shepherd and our king amen i'll pass the basket and so if you'll share your contact card in there then they'll be good to go elizabeth thanks so much uh i i don't mind being the liturgical nerd um, <laughs> I, I do love Christ the King Sunday because it's a great time to just renew our faith, to renew our allegiance to God as our master. Because when God, when Jesus is the king of your heart, it changes everything. It changes how fast you forgive. It changes how compassionate you are for other people. It changes who you are. So let's stand and sing to that God. notice we don't have our percussionist today so if you start clapping that's perfectly fine I'm looking straight at Allie because I know that she's got this <laughs>
of kings, um, I think of, you know, England, mostly, uh, but also throughout time, thousands upon thousands of people have died for kings, for the leaders of nations, but our king, Jesus, died for us. It's the opposite of what you expect. And he doesn't lead with aggression or dictatorship. He leads with love. And the way that we honor him is by adopting that same way of living. And it's um, when he was crucified, he was between two criminals. And one said, if you are who you say you are, come, show, come down, show us your power. One of them tempted Jesus. And we all know people like that, a naysayer. We all know these people. But the person on the other side repented. I have done wrong, and you have not. And that man said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And there was immediate salvation. Jesus, in all of his agony, said, you will be with me today in paradise. Salvation is cheap. And I don't mean that in like a derogatory way. I mean he gives it easily when we ask for it. When you make Christ the king of your heart, it changes everything about you. It affects your confidence. It affects how you handle loss. It affects how quickly you forgive. So what God wants for us today is for us, you know, maybe in your prayer today, as you're talking to Jesus, declare him the king of your heart. Invite him to rule over your whole life. And See what amazing things he does with you. Let us pray. Lord, you tell us yourself that you are the good shepherd. 
who tell us that the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Lord, we are the sheep. We know that you bring with you life-changing power. We know that you were more than just a nice guy. You came from heaven. Jesus, you came from heaven for our salvation, to show us how to live, to show us how to love, to show us how to move about the world and serve our Father. And so we ask that you continue to change and transform us. We ask that you increase our faith so that when times are hard, we remember that you shepherd us. And we ask that you continue to fill us with more love for you because we know that whatever we love, that's how our life moves around the world. So increase our love for you so that we can increase our love for others. Jesus, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we honor you today, and we ask that you bless our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and sing. Amen. You were waiting 
to come to our time of prayer. Just a few prayer concerns to lift up this morning. I spoke with uh, Irma Henry this week, and she asked for prayers for her sister, Audrey Ellington, uh, who had been in the hospital this last week with some heart-related issues. And then I learned this morning from Ruth that Nancy Richards fell and broke her arm. And so but she's at home, right? And we don't know that there'll be surgery needed or anything like that. Okay, but we definitely want to surround uh, Nancy with our prayers uh, for healing. And then Nanette is home from the hospital and resting and resting well in the care of her in the care of her family. And so uh, she continues to heal and grow go stronger every day. And then we had an anniversary this week. Elmer and Renita Swan celebrated uh, seven years of wedded bliss. So we celebrate that with them as well. Perhaps there are other concerns on your heart. If you are watching online, you can drop your concerns in the uh, comment section. And then if you have prayers that you want lifted up, you can also put yours, those of you here uh, can put them on the comment card uh, uh, the contact card in the basket and I will see those and add them to my weekly and daily prayers so let us go to the Lord in prayer let us pray king of kings and lord of lords imagining your reign can be difficult it is hard for us to picture a world governed by your justice and your righteousness alone. Our minds are held captive by the worst images of human kings, rulers, and dictators whose rule over, who rule over nations and people through fear, oppression, human injustice, and war. O oh Lord, free the borders of our imaginations that we may truly envision your greater good for all people on earth as it is in heaven. Let the reign of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, our Savior, be evident in all that we say and think and do. Give us the confidence and courage to truly be your witnesses all the days of our lives. For we offer this prayer in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So today, as we bring to a close the Christian year on this Christ the King Sunday, I want to share a word of scripture that perhaps uh, it might be a little different as we mark the end of the liturgical year. A passage that shows us that Christ is not only our king, but our shepherd. Hear now this familiar and perhaps favorite word of scripture, Psalm 23. I'm actually using the New King James Version. Normally I use the NIV but um, there are just some passages of scripture that need the King James. And here is the new King James. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. 
my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let us pray. Almighty God, still the busyness of our minds. Open our hearts to you so we may hear your word for us this day. Amen. So through the ages, sheep have gotten a pretty bad rap in life, right? We consider sheep to be pretty dumb. But actually, they're kind of smart. If you go to sheep101.com, that's a real thing, sheep101.com, you'll find all kinds of useful information about sheep and about how smart they are. So we know from Scripture that sheep know the sound of the voice or they know the voice of their shepherd. But did you know that they can also remember their shepherd's face and in fact the faces of over 50 other sheep in the flock so they recognize one another ladies you'll be glad to know that yous the female sheep have a definite opinion uh, about the rams that that they know what they like and don't like in in a ram and so they they they're pretty persnickety and uh, picky about the rams that they allow to come around them and then um, sheep in great britain are pretty smart because they have taught themselves uh, the certain little flock have taught themselves how to roll over an eight-foot cattle guard so they can uh, get into the gardens of unsuspecting Brits. So that's a pretty smart sheep. So they have, uh, they have some pretty good smarts about them. So we wonder why then they've gotten such a bad reputation, right? Well, I think it is their flocking instinct that sheep have because what happens is that when one runs they all run they may not know why they're running but it's like oh they're running I'm gonna run and so they tend to flock together they tend to do what all the other sheep are doing they go with the crowd and then the other thing that sheep tend to do is that when they eat they have their head down and they go from this grass to this grass to this grass to this grass and before you know it they have nibbled themselves right off the farm which is why they need the protection of the shepherd so the shepherd the good shepherd as it is uh, in this passage is central to this psalm And I would venture to guess that Psalm 23 is probably one of the most familiar, one of the most beloved psalms of them all. In fact, I saw some of you reciting it with me. You know it. You know it by heart. These are very familiar words. It's probably one of the best known passages. It ranks right up there with the Lord's Prayer and John 3.16. It has been read and sung recited and prayed throughout the centuries is it it is a passage that has uh, stood the test of time spans the ages unites the masses and it just feeds our soul dementia patients their eyes will light up they often they don't you know they're not oriented to what is in the present but they when they hear this passage their eyes will light up in the same way that our souls light up when we hear it in just six short verses that's all that's all this psalm is six short verses it weaves together two very strong images that of the shepherd and the host shepherd and host. So that's the central figures in this passage. Now, the first century uh, Christians, they would have, and even, you know, in Jesus' day in antiquity, they immediately would have known what the psalmist meant by using this imagery of a shepherd and a host. A shepherd represents goodness. 
loyalty, and devotion. Now, the number one job of the shepherd is to protect the flock, to protect the sheep, to care for their flock's well-being. The sheep has no wants, no worries, no needs, because the shepherd cares for everything. And then that image of the host just takes the work of the shepherd, this idea, a step further. And it, and it exceeds the minimum expectations of hospitality. Both the shepherd and the host offer protection. Both the shepherd and the host provide hospitality. Both the shepherd and the host provide shelter. Both the shepherd and the host provide food and rest. But a host goes over and above what is needed and expected. So the picture, the picture that the psalmist is painting for us this morning is not one of scarcity, but one of abundance. The shepherd picks out the most lush pasture with the greenest of fields and the sweetest of grass. Water that is still and provides refreshment. A cup overflowing. The Lord does not scrimp when it comes to his children. So what are the takeaways for us this morning with this beautiful and familiar passage? First, and perhaps the most obvious, is we learn a little bit about the nature of God. Like the shepherd, God is, uh, wants the very best for his children, wants the very best for his flock. When, and doesn't want them to be in harm's way. You, heard, you know the line, that he leads me beside still waters. Now, why is that important? Why would that be important for a shepherd to, to take the sheep to still waters? Well, <clears throat> sheep tend to wade out in the water when they're drinking, and water will get on their, their fleece, and it gets very heavy. And if they were in rushing waters, their feet would come out from under them from the weight of their, their bodies now, now loaded down with water. And, and it would mean certain death. So the shepherd wants to lead them to still water so that they might be able to take their time drinking and not fear for the life of their sheep with Christ as our good shepherd, he will never put us in harm's way, but seek to protect us. You know, um, I guess about a month or so ago, we were uh, studying and I was preaching on Adam Hamilton's book, Half Truths. And one of the half truths was that God uh, won't put on us more than we can handle. But the truth is God is not the one who puts things on us. But God helps us handle the things that we are experiencing, the things that we go through. When we allow Christ to be our shepherd and our king, we will come to realize that the good shepherd only wants the very best for us and will help lead us out of harm's way, would never lead us into harm's way. The other thing we learn about God is he's ubiquitous, always there, ever present. God is ever present, just like the good shepherd, whether awake or asleep, in the pasture, in the field, in the pen. The shepherd is right there with the sheep, making sure that they are protected, that there's no wild animals. You know, uh, shepherds would 
the pen was really more of a cave and the shepherd would lay across the opening, put his whole body uh, between the elements of the outside and the cave on the inside to protect the sheep, lay his body down to protect. That's what a good shepherd does. Christ laid out his body for us, for our forgiveness. Like the good shepherd or the, the Lord is there with us and for us, whether we are on the quiet hillside of life where things are peaceful and calm or whether we're also in the valley, in the valley of the shadow of death where um, enemies lurk, where the beast is ready to pounce on us. Whatever it is, the Lord is there with us. I know that you know what it's like to be in that valley. You've, we've all been there, different kinds of uh, circumstances. Some of you this week alone have been through hell and back with different things that you have been experienced, whether it's death or a broken relationship, loss of a job, breach of trust. You are not alone. Whatever it is that you are facing, Christ, your king, your shepherd is... Your teacher is right there in the trenches with you. Christ, your king, will go to war with you to help you fight whatever those battles are that are assailing you. Now, second and perhaps not so obvious, um, we can learn from this scripture, the very from, uh, learn a little something about uh, from the sheep themselves. Sheep are better together than apart. Their natural instinct is to flock together, to stay together. It is not until they're separated, when they wander off and nibble themselves off the farm, that they get themselves in trouble. Isn't that true for us too? We, we are better together. And in this case, that togetherness is the community of the church. There is strength in numbers. If we try to manage our journey through life alone, we miss one of the greatest benefits of what it means to be in a community of faith. We miss out on the safety and the strength and the support that we get from, from one another. Last week in Bible study, we were talking about uh, what the church and especially this church offers us. And, and we were talking about how um, many of them said what they really love most about this church is, is the people, and especially the ones in this particular class was naming their Sunday school class, that they find support from others within, uh, within this community. And I can't tell you how many people have told me, uh, not just in this church but in other churches that I have served, it's like, They'll say, I don't know what I would have done. You know, I don't know how I would have gotten through uh, this loss of a loved one or this illness or this job loss or whatever it was if the people of the church had not surrounded them and supported them in the midst of it. There's no other community like the community of faith. You know, you can go to great civic organizations, Rotary, Lions, Kiwanis. Those are, those are great civic organizations filled with good people who will ask, how are you doing? But church people, not just ask how you're doing, they'll help you do it. Whatever it is that you're going through, they're going to help you get through it. Lastly, I think this passage gives us a good word about spiritual readiness. Did you notice how the still waters come before the valley? That refreshment comes before the hardest part of the journey? That the banquet comes before sitting down with your enemies? It's important for us to be refreshed and renewed before we go to battle, before the tragedies, before the struggles, the pitfalls, the loss, the grief. We have to be ready before we come under attack. 
Any of you that have served in the military know that is to be true, that you train and train and train for readiness so that you know what to do. Uh, it's muscle memory when you're in the trenches. Rusty and I lived in uh, Bossier City right uh, near Barksdale Air Force Base, and we used to see the, those B-52s are in the air 24 hours a day. There's always a plane in the air. They were always training, still are, uh, so that they would be ready for whatever uh, they are tasked with, whatever their duty is. So how do we get ready? How do we get ready as Christians uh, how do we make Christ our king? And I think what, how we do that is by attending to the spiritual practices that John Wesley called acts of piety. Worship, study of scripture, prayer, fasting, celebrating the sacraments. These are all ways that we build a relationship with Christ our King. It's how we learn the voice of the shepherd. We need to be fueled up and prayed up and spiritually ready because we don't know what battles are ahead and that will assail us. We don't know what tough times are coming our way. But if we have tended to these acts of piety, worship, study, prayer, fasting, sacraments, we will be ready for whatever comes our way. So one last thing, one last kind of little tidbit of thought. Uh, I got a little distracted as I was uh, looking at sheep101.com. And um, one of the things that they were talking about was that the shepherd has a helpmate out there in the field, and it's sheepdogs. Sheepdogs are out there helping the shepherd corral all those sheep. So I got to thinking about that. And um, I, I kind of thought that maybe that there were a couple of sheepdogs in Psalm 23 as well. Their names are goodness and mercy. Two sheepdogs that help the good shepherd keep us in line. Who are the sheepdogs in your life those spiritual mentors praying mothers guardian angels sunday school teachers youth directors mentors friends who are those people here on earth that are helping to guide you feed you and help you along in your faith journey. Who is your goodness and mercy? So my prayer for you, for me, for us, is that Christ will be the good shepherd in our life. That he will be the ruler over our hearts and the leader of our lives. Amen. And amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, lead us and give us the courage to follow. Amen. I love the fact that in this worship service that we do get to share in the sacrament of Holy Communion and act what John Wesley would have called an act of piety the reminder that Christ our king laid down his life for us so that we would know that we truly are forgiven so as we gather around this table we are reminded of that night that Jesus gathered with his disciples he took the bread blessed it broke it, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. And in like manner he took the cup, blessed it, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this all of you, for this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Almighty God, send your Holy Spirit upon us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood and knowing that we are truly forgiven. Lord, help us to submit to you as our king, as our ruler, as the leader of our lives. Amen. Because there is one loaf, we are reminded that we are one body. But just like this bread, we too must be broken open, just like the cup poured out, so that we might be made whole. And the cup of blessing in which we share, is it not a means of sharing in all the blessings that Christ has in store for us? These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And everyone is welcomed at the Lord's table. You don't have to be a member of the church. You don't even have to be United Methodist. You need only to believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. In this service, we share a common loaf, but we have individual cups. And if you would prefer prepackaged, we have that in the basket as well. So the table has been set. There is a place for you. So come and freely receive. good stuff is happening around here uh, it is just amazing uh, all the good things that are happening in the life of the church there's lots of really good 
Advent opportunities. In fact, in the back over there is a card with a Christmas ornament. The theme for Advent that starts next week is a Christmas carol. And so I hope that you will uh, pick up one of those cards, share it with a friend, invite them to come and uh, join us for the many wonderful opportunities that we have this Advent season. Uh, next week we're going to kick off our Advent Bible study. It's going to be on Sundays in the afternoons. It's, the time moves around a little bit, but I'll tell you each week. But next week it's going to be at 4 o'clock, and uh, we're doing the Redemption of Scrooge based on Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol. Jonathan, were you able to get the little promo video? Okay, well, so the author, Matt Rawl, who is my friend, and is it your nephew? Ruth, so Ruth's nephew, my friend Matt Rawl, the author of this book, is coming uh, next week. He is going to present uh, the first lesson and all that good stuff, so please come. Come for that. If you don't come any other week, come this, this next week. Uh, see Matt, meet Matt. He is amazing. He's just a um, very dynamic speaker. We'll be in the Seekers Room uh, at 4 o'clock next Sunday. Uh, Live nativity is one of those things, all hands on deck. I have no idea what happened to last week's sign-up clipboards. They got moved, and I don't know where they got moved, but I will find them before the end of the day, um, and we will know who has signed up. But uh, if you want to help with that, please do. Uh, if, if I don't find them before... Um, before the end of this day call the church office we'll get you signed up because we're going to need lots of people in lots of different places none of it's hard except maybe mark's job with um uh, <laughs> mark's job is hard <laughs> he does all, all the setup but all the other stuff is easy you know you just have to look angelic right yeah. yes so you know uh, put on a costume and and uh, you know rusty gets is going to be one of the wise men you know and and so i mean if he can fake being a wise guy i mean <laughs> you know the, the rest of you can fake being angels i'm sure so anyway <laughs> i want to roll today all right all right, anyway, there's great stuff. Pick up one of those cards. Uh, share that with a friend. Come, come be a part of the great stuff happening this Advent season. Elizabeth? Hopefully the sign-up sheet is lost because everyone's fighting over it. Like, right? No, that's I want to sign up. I'm sure that's what it that's is. That's it, that's it. I'll, yes. I'm going to put you in charge of recruiting the way you want to everyone to <laughs> sign up for the uh, cantata. Guys, we have 30 people. Um, that's amazing. For the cantata. It sounded really good. Yeah, and we, yeah. We, um, we barely know what we're doing, and it sounds good. I mean, it's great. So um, if you want to join us, there's lots of safety in numbers. You know, it's a great time to join the choir. F flock you, together. Well, and everyone's just so nice, too. So, like, it's a great chance to, like, meet some cool people who go to church here. Yeah? Uh, let's stand and sing together.
ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name i come alive to declare your victory the resurrected king is resurrecting me by your spirit i will rise from the ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting where you work, where you play, and where you live. And may the peace of God be with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.